Ausgabe 44 des Science Busters Podcasts und Nobel geht die Welt zugrunde. But the Ig Nobel will rise. Willkommen zur 44. Ausgabe des Science Busters Podcasts. Nur noch sechs Ausgaben bis Ausgabe 50 und dann gibt es einen großen Staatsakt in der Hofburg. Produziert immer mit Unterstützung der Uni Graz und der TU Wien. Mein Name ist Martin Puntigam, das ist unverändert, aber meine Gegenübers heute sind sehr verändert. Heute mir gegenüber eine richtig üppige Runde aus nah und fern. Finnland, USA, Deutschland, Österreich. Aus Anlass des siebten heinz ober awards der 2022 an den fantastischen Ig Nobelpreis gegangen ist, sitzen mir gegenüber der Erfinder des Preises, Mark Abrahams, und vier Gewinnerinnen der vergangenen Jahre. Mina Lyons, Universität Liverpool, John Morris, Doktor in Psychologie und unter anderem auf Psychopathien bei Mensch und Tier spezialisiert. Die Zoologin Sabine Begall, Professorin an der Uni Duisburg-Essen, spezialisiert auf Sinnesbiologie unterirdisch lebender Nagetiere. Was es damit genau auf sich hat, werden wir später hören. David Hugh, Professor für Ingenieurwissenschaften und Biologie am Georgia Institute of Technology und zweifacher Gewinner, der sich sehr gut, zumindest aus wissenschaftlicher Sicht, mit dem großen und kleinen Geschäft auskennt. Und Elisabeth Obertaucher, Mitglied des Science Busters, bestens bekannt und 2015 Gewinnerin in Mathematik und ausgezeichnet für die Untersuchungen der Zeugungskraft eines blutrünstigen Despoten. Nice to have you in Vienna. Hello. 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 Hello again. So you heard everyone. The podcast will be in German and English. We will start in German now. A letzte Ausgabe, um noch einen kurzen Rückblick zu haben, haben Ruth Krützbach und ich gesprochen in der Folge, woher die kleinen Galaxien kommen, über Babyfotos von Galaxien, Grönemeyer Astronomie versus Nena Astronomie und True Crime im Kosmos. Und heute geht es um den Ig Nobelpreis und wir beginnen folgerichtigerweise mit Mark Abrahams, der den Preis erfunden hat. Hi Mark, you invented the prize and what did you do before the invention? Back in 1991, suddenly I became the editor of a science magazine. With that came a big change. Suddenly I was surrounded all the time by people who had done very odd bits of science. Many of those things were not at all famous. Almost nobody had heard of them. And a lot of them were very funny. They were so surprising, so very surprising that they would strike anybody instantly as being funny and then interesting. After a short time, I started to almost obsess about the idea that these people, they have done these things, they will go their whole life, they will die, and almost nobody will ever know they did them. And that's wrong. Somebody should do something about that. And then I realized, well, we can do something small. And so that was more or less the beginning, the idea of the thing. And I also wanted to have some kind of event for the magazine. So those two things combined. I started going around and telling people about this idea and everybody, or at least it, it felt like everybody wanted to be helpful. And over the next few months, people offered a place to have it at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a big uh, university in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I live. Uh, a lot of scientists volunteered to help. A lot of theater people volunteered to help. We picked some winners. We put the word out on the internet, which was much smaller at that point, that the first annual Ig Nobel Prize ceremony will happen on whatever the date was. And this first year, the tickets will be free, but you have to come to a particular office at MIT on Wednesday afternoon or whenever it was to get the tickets. That day, all the tickets disappeared almost instantly. So suddenly we had a full audience waiting. We picked some winners. I had been interviewing lots of scientists. So I, I had become friendly with four people who have Nobel Prizes and who also seem to have a sense of humor about themselves. So I called each of them up, told them about it and said, hey, would you like to come and help 
hand out the prizes and maybe dress up in some crazy way, you know, wear a funny hat or something. And all of them said, okay. And I was also meeting a lot of uh, journalists, especially science journalists. So I told a lot of them and a lot of journalists showed up. So that first time we had a nice building at MIT. We had a full audience. We had people almost climbing the walls, trying to get in. We had winners. We had famous scientists and we did the ceremony, which we were making up as we went along. And we all had the feeling, I'm pretty sure as we were doing this, that we were all looking around the room thinking any moment now, some grown up person is going to walk into this room and tell us to stop this and go home. But no grown-up appeared. And It was designed as a guilty pleasure? No, it just felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a good time, and it got tremendous amounts of publicity in the press around the world and became pretty well-known that first year. And because it became well-known that first year, and because we've been so lucky, really, in all this happening... The second year, we could do it on a much bigger scale. And that's continued every year. And this is now the 32nd year. And now you have to do it or you still like it? Well, there's no law passed saying I'm compelled to do this. But yeah, it's we have something that I think is really pretty wonderful. We've got really literally hundreds of people around the world involved. And if you count the people who won Ig Nobel Prizes, we got 10 prizes a year for 32 years now, and some of those go to big teams. So there are lots of people. And some of them are just really the most astounding people. Um, this I'm going to say to you, because you and I are looking at each other in the same room. I can't really say it to anybody who's not here, who's just listening, but look at the people sitting in the room with us. They have Ig Nobel Prizes. And you could talk to any one of them for days on end. I've gotten to know all of them. The thing they did, the, the, the surprising thing, the thing that makes people laugh and think, the thing that got them their Ig Nobel Prize, that's just one thing that each of them did. Each of them has an enormous list of other bizarre, wonderful, thought-provoking, maybe crazy, maybe spectacularly wonderful things they've done. So I, I feel so lucky that I get to meet all these people, and they get to meet each other. And the audiences who come to the ceremony get to talk to them and meet them. So... Really, one way I think of this is this is a giant sort of physics exercise of bouncing people off each other and letting them bounce their ideas off each other. And then things happen. You know, I, I, I and the rest of us, we just start these little chain reactions. And it's not only the day of the ceremony, but it's a couple of days up front and afterwards. Yeah, the ceremony itself now, we moved it in the fifth year, uh, two miles down the road in Cambridge to Harvard University. And that's where it's been every year since. And it's a big, beautiful, um, very dignified auditorium. And two days later, all the winners get to do uh, short public talks mm -hmm. uh, and where they explain in more detail what they're doing and, and where the audience gets to ask them questions. That's kind of the best part of the thing. So, yeah. And then it also started expanding into events and tours around the world, including every year, except during pandemic years, uh, we do a big uh, tour, Ig Nobel tour of Europe, uh, where a bunch of Ig Nobel winners, including all the people who are seated in the room here with me, except you, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> do events. And people come, and the people who come get to talk to the people who won the events. And, and it just keeps growing into all kinds of things. So the Ig Nobel Prize literally became your life? It's a big part of it. It's, it's become the central thing. I also edit the magazine and I write for other magazines and all sorts of stuff. But it's all tied together and it's all about this same central thing, things, research and anything else that is so utterly surprising that its immediate effect is on anybody is it makes you laugh and then it makes you think. Speaking of the magazine, uh, when you were a child, I, I, I presume you, your, your biggest wish wasn't to become uh, an editor of a, magazine, a science magazine. So how come? Yeah, you know, no, I never had that thought that you just uttered um, until this moment. But I did, when I was a little kid, it probably was kind of strange because I like doing several kinds of things and I'm doing all of them now. Uh, I... I 
when I was even tiny, I liked to write and I liked to gather um, strange things that were funny, especially if they were about science. I used to keep a notebook of these things and I liked to organize stuff. Uh, I like things that were funny. I also like playing baseball. I don't do that anymore, but that's never been part of the Ig Nobel. But yeah, uh, I never thought about becoming the editor of a magazine because I had no idea. Have you ever thought of uh, making baseball part of the Ig Nobels? Well, now that you mention that, we have made baseball part of the Ig Nobels. <laughs> I was just forgetting. At the ceremony... The ceremony is very complicated, lots of people, lots of things, and we engineer it very heavily in advance to make sure everything happens really fast and there are no dead spots. And part of that is we have a referee, a sports referee on mm -hmm. stage, and he's a real professional referee. And one of the sports he referees is baseball. So yes, thanks, Lisa. I had somehow overlooked that for the moment. Baseball has been a very important part of this. You enjoyed several things as a kid, mm -hmm. uh, but you had to go to school as well. Did you enjoy that? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I got to, uh, to learn all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, math was one of those things. And I did kind of enjoy it. I never utterly loved it, but I liked it a lot. And that's what I ended up majoring in in college was applied mathematics. It's a phrase that uh, nobody is able to define, but that's what I majored in. Why applied? The real mathematics is doing proofs. And it's very, from my point of view, very dry and just I couldn't get interested in it. But applied math just meant you have to learn some more math so that you can try to understand all kinds of different stuff. And I always like doing all kinds of different stuff at the same time, which is not a good way to lead your life. But hey, that's the way I am. To do some research, uh, to become scientists, that's too many different things that interested you? Most, at least as far as I was aware, everybody that I met who was a scientist had picked one thing or had been forced to pick one thing. And that's what they did with almost all their time because they just had no time to do anything else. And I just, I'm very unhappy if I have to do just one thing for a long time. I did that. I tried it as an experiment <laughs> when I was in my early twenties for about six months. I just did one thing. My job, I was working uh, for a, a, a little computer company who was inventing um, some optical character recognition stuff, machines that would read printed books, say, and, and um, turn that into speech for mm -hmm. blind people and some whole bunch of other things related to that. And for six months, I was really happy. It was a luxury concentrating on just one project that I was was doing. After six months, I was starting to feel extremely frustrated. So I started doing other things on the side and found I'm much happier that way. So ever since then, I've tried to make sure that I never get trapped doing just only one thing. So you were never tempted to go to university? Well, I went to university. Went? I even graduated from university. Um, As a fact, Bill Gates, you've heard of Bill Gates? Uh, Bill Gates went to the same university. He was a year ahead of me. I think he majored in the same thing I did. And I started a software company also. You know, he started a software company. And the major difference between us is that I graduated from college and he didn't. So I made a horrible mistake in doing that. <laughs> You stayed in contact with Bill Gates? No, as far as I know, I've never met him. I'm sure we were in the same room, but you know, he was a year older than me and he mm. dropped out of college. So, so you uh, despised him for dropping out of college? No, I didn't, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> yeah, so how old were you uh, when, when the, the Ig Nobel Prize thing happened? I was what 34 years old. And that started because at that point, I had been writing a lot of stuff, collecting funny stuff about science and showing it to just a few friends. And one day I started to wonder, could I get something published in a magazine or a book or something? I didn't know. I'd never tried. So I sent uh, some of the things I had written off to a science magazine just to see if they would print something. And I got a phone call from a man who said, hello, I'm the, um, I'm the publisher 
of the magazine. We got your articles. Would you be the editor of the magazine? And that's how I started doing that. <laughs> that was uh, at that time. Uh, I, I think it was unusual science to, to be funny. That, that yes, was not yes, the, the way to think. It still is, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it has changed a lot in the last it has, uh, two decades. It, it has changed, and I like to think that um, you and I and the other people in this room had at least a small role to play in changing that. You know, and I think uh, one good effect of what we're doing, at least I hope, is that it makes a lot more people become curious about science and feel right from their f first exposure to anything scientific that, hey, this is something people do. It's not something that, uh, you know, these fictional gods <laughs> who you'll never actually uh, meet because they're not real. They're, 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 you know, They're Nobel Prize winners, whatever those are. Um, they're, they're probably, you know, uh, stone statues or something. I don't know. So what I really hope is that people hear about the Ig Nobel Prizes um, or they hear about Science Busters or any of the things that any of us here are doing. And a little bit, they think, uh, you know, maybe I could get involved with something like that or start something on my own. It's, it's not a, an impossible thing from another universe. I can be part of that. Maybe I can do something even better. Yeah, that's a, a, a very high goal. I think uh, if, if people are not emotionally repelled when, when science is mentioned, I yeah. think that's the first step. Uh, and that's the, the most important step because that's uh, how I grew up uh, in, 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 when I went to the, That's high school, gymnasium, mm -hmm. thinking that chemistry uh, or physics or biology is dull and boring. And for the strange guys in class, that was uh, state of the art. And, yeah, uh, and you yeah. have to change that. Yeah. I don't know how it was for you, but f when I was growing up, it looked like a few of the teachers, especially in the, the younger grades, really loved science and math. But most of the teachers didn't, and I always thought they seemed to be a little bit frightened of it. And as time went on, I started to think I was lucky that I got a few teachers who really enjoyed this stuff and thought it was just lively and great because the kids that I grew up with who had the other teachers, they don't seem very interested in science. They don't seem to think of it as something that they can think about or get involved in. And that's really a shame. I mean, they're They're losing out on a lot of the fun in life. So uh, when um, choosing the award uh, winners uh, every year, we have here uh, Minna, David, uh, Sabine, and Elisabeth. How do you get to choose? Well, there's a big bunch of us, um, roughly 100 people involved, uh, spread around the world. And we have many, many meetings, some formal meetings, but mostly very informal chats. And really, we argue. Where the, the nominations come from is uh, two places or two directions. One is all of us are always looking around, things we read, or things we hear about, people who talk to us. But that's the smaller part. The bigger part, and this is something that started almost immediately the first year is people who read about the Ig Nobel Prizes or hear about it, one day they hear about somebody who should win a prize, or maybe they think they themselves should, and they send us email or a letter. or if they hey, People it. who want to win and, send emails? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's been consistent every year, something like something between 10 and 20% of all the nominations that come in are people nominating themselves. And they win? They almost never win. <laughs> <laughs> but a few of them have. A very few of them have. Um, And are but, they in the, in the same room with us? I'm not going to answer that question <laughs> to you. No, no. And um, just to give you an idea of the size of things, one year, maybe about 10 years or so ago, I became curious about how many nominations do we get every year. So for one year, I, I did a rough count as things came in. And there were about 9,000 new nominations that year. And we also, the, the numbers are much bigger because the things we do not choose, you know, this year, for example, if, if the ones that are still in that pool that look like, hey, this is pretty good and has a chance, we'll consider that again the next year. 
And so, and we can look back, you know, as far as about 50 years. That's our you have of, thousands every year, and they consider them all. Well, every we don't year. consider the thousands on one day. Okay. We filter <laughs> them out as they come in. You know, if, if you have a large number of things coming in, and you have to choose a small number from that, if you have to do that all in one day, that's impossible. But if you do that a little bit every day, that's really not so hard. And this, this applies, I think, to anything in the universe where you have to pick a small number from a large number. After you've been doing it a short time, you quickly develop the skill of recognizing the things that have no chance. And that's the majority of things coming in really have no chance. So you get to rule those out. So you, your effort and your time really is concentrated on just a small fraction of what mm. comes in. The other thing I, I should mention, because I think it's important, is that in almost every case, when we choose somebody to win a prize or choose a team to win a prize, we get in touch with them very quietly. We offer them the prize. And if they want to say no, that's okay. And if somebody says no, we do not give them the prize and we don't tell anybody. But almost everybody we offer the prize to says yes. And the people you offer the prize, they realize that's the real call or they think it's a prank? Most of them don't think it's a prank. You know, we're not important enough for people to think <laughs> that. Uh, in the early years, of course, almost none of them had heard of the Ig Nobel Prize, so it was a lot more work to educate them. <laughs> uh, but as time went on, that's changed. And in recent years, especially the majority of people in every country that we offer a prize to, they know about the Ig Nobel Prize. Some of them, quite a few of them now, turned out they're even big fans of the Ig Nobel Prize and had been kind of hoping. Uh, sometimes with those ones, the thing that we give them a prize for is not the thing that they expected. There was one, I remember, uh, who we gave a prize to, Charles Paxton and his team in England. And this was about 20 years ago. Um, they did uh, some research about ostriches and um, and uh, raising ostriches um, for meat on farms in England and the, the courtship behavior of those ostriches towards human beings. They discovered that the ostriches that were hatched from eggs in farms looked around and they saw large creatures with wings and they saw other large creatures without wings. And most of those those newly hatched ostriches uh, apparently became sexually attracted to the group that did not have wings. And that was a big problem for the ostrich industry. That's why the ostrich industry did not grow very big. When I called Charles Paxton to offer him the prize in secret, he, he knew all about the Ig Nobel Prize. And he was very excited. And he said, you know, I'm not surprised I'm getting this call and offered a prize, but I really expected that it would be for my work on sea monsters. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's so much unexpected about every piece of what we're doing here. Every day is like that. Um, nowadays, the, the Ig Nobel Prize is well known and famous, but uh, uh, um, do you think some scientists design the, the title of their publications Uh, so they, the chances rise to win the prize? Do I think so? No, I know so. <laughs> <laughs> But the, um, I'll, I'll answer a slightly different question, which is do people begin to do research? Do they choose the thing they're going to do research on because they want to win an Ig Nobel Prize? A lot of people do that. And none of them win. It's always very clear that's what they're doing. They lack that quality we look for about making people laugh and making people think. If you want to win an Ig Nobel Prize, my best advice is stop trying. It's a side effect of what you're doing. And if you win, it will come as a surprise. And also, here's something else that seems to be true for most of the winners Although these things seem funny to almost everybody in the world, mm -hmm. most of them do not seem funny to the person who's doing it because that's their work and it's what they've been doing every day. And no matter what your work is, even if it seems insane to you the first day or two, once you start doing it and get involved, it begins to seem ordinary and it it becomes difficult for you to see how completely different your life is from everybody else in the universe, even your family.
sitting next to you, Minna Lyons, was uh, shaking her head when you uh, told uh, told me about that everyone finds the things, the research funny, but not the person who is doing it. Uh, I think you you agree. Yeah, so I totally agree. So uh, we received the Ig Nobel Prize in 2014 for... Uh, study that was done with serious intentions. So we were investigating the um, night owls, so people who tend to stay up late mm -hmm. and uh, wake up late in the morning, and psychopathic traits. Mm -hmm. And then we discover discovered that we won the Ig Nobel. I was surprised because It was a serious study. I did not find it funny at all. So it really resonates what Mark was saying that people who do these studies don't actually think that they are funny at all. And I can see everybody else around the table <laughs> nodding their heads like, you know, like not, not funny at all, like the things that you've, you've designed. So you, you did some research about people staying up late and tending to uh, be psychopath. Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, so I did actually this research uh, together with one of my undergraduate psychology students who was a big um, inspiration in designing the study. And it actually uh, was from her own anecdotal experiences as a young student in the nightlife of Liverpool and of then um, finding that there are really odd characters, a bit like creepy creatures hanging out in the corners of the nightclubs late at night. And Amy Jones, who was my student, came to talk to me about some ideas that she had for her final undergraduate dissertation work. And Amy was wondering that would it be worthwhile to study uh, personality traits of people who have the tendency to stay up late. And this um, staying up late is something that seems to be a stable characteristic. It's called chronotype mm -hmm. also, or morningness, eveningness. And it seems to be relatively stable throughout the uh, people's lives. And it does have um, a biological basis as well. So uh, we, I designed research with Amy um, looking at whether people who have so-called dark triad traits have the tendency to be evening people. So the dark triad consists of um, a bit aversive personality traits of um, psychopathy, Machiavellianism and narcissism. Mm -hmm. And there are some evolutionary ideas on why higher levels of these traits exist. And it could potentially be because they confer adaptive advantage in terms of um, cheating people and um, getting benefits from other people by by being uh, dishonest to them and being exploitative um, to others, towards others. So we thought that maybe the people who stay up late, there could be some kind of a correlation between psychopathic traits as well, because in the nighttime, uh, there's a lot of behaviors that relate to crime and sex and things that would be beneficial for people who are who are inspired um, by by these kind of actions so yeah we did a little study like nothing significant honestly it was like a undergraduate project that we had a lot of fun like doing a, an online questionnaire study When you tell me you, you were designing the studies, what did you do for research? You, you went to clubs, you, uh, you asked the people, you observed them. What was the research about? So we were actually a bit like more lazy. <laughs> we, we did an online uh, questionnaire because we did think about studying people in nightclubs, but it was difficult at my um, institution, my university where I worked at the time to get studies like uh, these through ethics, mm -hmm. because there's always a risk uh, to the student researcher. And in that university, there was no culture in doing observational studies in nightclubs. Mm -hmm. So we did an online questionnaire. <laughs> Instead, there are universities where there is a culture in, in such studies. Yeah, definitely. We did uh, such stuff in Vienna. Yeah, because you've done a lot of things like that in Vienna. Yeah. Can I move here, please, <laughs> to do oh, more interesting Vienna, studies? So, so, so to, to get your drinks financed, you do studies in nightclubs? <laughs> no, usually we have to pay our own. That's oh, the okay. downside, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of our studies are online 
question is mm-hmm. because there are limitations with the ethics and also uh, the financial side of things. So we have to do things cheaply. So it, it's a bit like the method is a little bit boring. So we had questionnaires for morningness, eveningness, and the dark triad. And, and, and do you have to believe uh, that the answers are true? Yeah, I mean, so so like thinking of the answers of the research that we did, like you know, we found small correlations. So mm-hmm. it's not like a like an earth shaking finding at all. But we did find like small correlations between aspects of psychopathy and also narcissism and Machiavellianism and the tendency to be um, a bit more inclined to stay up late in the night. But the other way around, if you like to stay up late, there's not uh, automatically a tendency to these kind of things. Yeah, absolutely not. So it, it, it doesn't mean that everybody who stays up late is a psychopath. <laughs> Or everybody so it, who it, is it, a psychopath it, stays up late. <laughs> so, yeah. This. May I ask you a question? Is there at least a possibility that everyone who stays up late is a psychopath? Mark, do you stay up late? Hi, hi Mina. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, maybe not absolutely everybody. I've started actually staying up late more recently, so I don't know if that's making me more psychopathic these days, because we don't actually know about the, so it's like the correlations and causations, like I've been asked that if somebody starts staying up late, does that change their like psychopathic traits too, but um, there is no research. I mean, I don't know if anybody's done that research or if they're just It's not any empirical research on that topic, so we don't know. We could do an experiment on us. So we try to change our like um, habits and stay up late or like you know go to bed early and then measure change in psychopathy. That would be fun. <laughs> you expanded the research on cats, is that right? Yeah, so I think I'm a little bit like Mark in that I get bored quite easily and I often do multiple different things. I don't just like investigate one thing when I do research. And we did some research on cat personality. Uh, We have this team called the Crazy Cat Ladies um, with a few of my colleagues and students. And um, we actually got inspirations from our own cats. So we often had a coffee and a cake, and then we talked about our cats, like during a break. So we all talk, my my Axel, for example, is really bold and brave, and everybody in my neighborhood knows him because he goes into people's houses, and he goes straight to the kitchen, to the fridge, and starts begging for food. Everybody in our neighborhood knows him, absolutely everybody. And then uh, my colleague, Gail Pruvers' cat, is completely different. So he goes away and hides if he sees anybody who he doesn't know. And then we were talking with each other about our cats and their craziness and quirkiness. And then we thought, oh, wait a minute. Is it possible that cats could have uh, psychopathic traits as well in a similar way as humans do? And theoretically, we based this idea on different neurobiological models that have been developed on on mammals and callousness. So there, like there are, for example, models in rodents, rats, on like the like aggressiveness and boldness. Mm-hmm. And then this kind of aggressiveness and boldness can be linked to human psychopathy. So there's one aspect of psychopathy which um, classifies it into three different traits, which callousness, so not really caring for others and being quite ag- aggressive, boldness, which is about not being timid or afraid of anything, and disinhibition, so not having self-control and just acting on an impulse. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are questionnaires measuring this three-part psychopathy in chimpanzees, for example. And of course, the chimpanzees don't fill in the questionnaires themselves, but it's the zookeepers who rate the chimpanzees. So it seems to be that, you know, the three, three part uh, psychopathy factor structure is present in chimpanzees. So then 
sharing our experiences of our own cats, we thought that, hey, wait a minute, like our cats could easily be like fitted into these three person, like mm-hmm. uh, three part personality model. And there are existing ideas about cat personality, but these three things don't really feature uh, clearly in, in the existing cat personality ideas. So then we developed, developed a questionnaire for cat psychopathy which was so much fun. This is like one of the like most fun projects that I've ever done because, you know, we did things like uh, we dressed up as cats and we went to a cat cafe uh, to celebrate a publication. And like, you know, we... Cat cafe? Yeah. What's that? It's a cafe in Liverpool that has got a lot of cats. And then you go and have a coffee and cake with cats. And you have to dress up like a cat? You, you don't have to, but we did it. <laughs> Because we thought that it, it, it's a fun way to celebrate. And uh, the personality of the cat, um, does it say anything about uh, the person, uh, the, the human who uh, uh, lives with the cat? I mean, of course, there are biases on how humans view their cats as well. But um, I think we can quite objectively rate our cats on things like how aggressive the cat is, like, uh, you know, towards people or towards other pets or or how bold or timid the cat is. So I think owners are probably able to quite objectively, like, look at their cats on, on many different things. So what we actually did first uh, was that we collected stories of cats from about 500 people. So we, we just asked them to describe their cats And then we extracted like uh, different items from those stories and uh, like put that into like a questionnaire where people had to st- strongly agree or disagree on different uh, statements. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And then we also, in order to validate the questionnaire a little bit, we wanted to see if cat activity levels are correlating with their owner's ratings mm-hmm. of uh, their boldness and meanness and this in- inhibition. So we had little Fitbits with um, like 20, what was it, 40, 20 cats. My cat Axel was one of the participants in this Fitbit study. So we measured the cat's activity levels for the duration of five days. And then we correlated the activity levels with the owner-rated uh, mm-hmm. questionnaire on psychopathy. And we found that uh, the cats that were more physically active uh, during the day uh, were also higher in psychopathy facet of um, boldness. So they were like less timid. And uh, my cat, Axel, was the most active cat in the whole whole. And sample. there's a correlation to the owner. So you yeah. go to other houses, sit, yeah, yeah, exactly. sits for, uh, he goes to other houses, in front of the, like, you know, of the he, fridge he, and beg yeah. for food. Yeah, yeah, he goes anywhere to find and, food. And you do it as well? <laughs> yeah, follow the cat. <laughs> Can I have a chicken dinner, please? <laughs> Mina, you mentioned the crazy cat ladies. Uh, did you test yourself for toxoplasmosis? Oh, so that's a really good idea, actually, because I had a long conversation with my teenage daughter about toxoplasmosis only two days ago, because our cat has started behaving in a different way. So he's more affectionate, like crazy affectionate, and he was never like that before. Define, please, uh, toxoplasmosis. Go on, Sabine, toxoplasmosis. Well, that's... Uh, oh, how do you <laughs> explain maybe, it? Maybe, maybe we... Could yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to do this in the most complicated way possible. We gave an Ig Nobel Prize for exactly this, for uh, a research study done by some people in the Czech Republic to try to see whether, I'm trying to remember the details of it, whether cats that are uh, infected with this parasite cause their owners to become schizophrenic. And as to the question that Martin asked about what is this toxoplasmosis, I would prefer to turn to the biologist who's sitting to my left here, uh, to Lisa. Lisa? I have to explain toxoplasmosis now. Um, Into the microphone, too. Sabina, you were starting off with it. Um, I can. I, I let, can. Let me. I, I let me. Cannot, let me suggest. Let me, uh, let me suggest well. that you keep this going because there's yes. another biologist in the room. And oh yes. Could, yeah. Oh, David. David, you look so knowing. Can you answer the question? What is toxoplasmosis? It's a. It's a virus. It's a. Into the microphone. 
<laughs> Never mind, we will write it in the show notes. Uh, <laughs> If there's anyone listening who knows what toxoplasmosis is and can say it in a few, a very few clear words that anyone would understand, don't send it to us. Just turn to whoever's near you and explain it to them, please. Yes. Thanks. So do the cats, are those behaviors learned or are they born, just born that way? Well, that is the question of all the questions. We don't really know. So, of course, there's a little bit of genetic be basis for behavior, clearly. But, of course, there are things that are influencing cats as humans and like many other creatures too, uh, during their development. So I think um, there are things like attachment and like what like at what point they were weaned of their, their mothers and things like that that influence cats cat's personality development, but I, I must say, I have got no idea on how much cat psychopathy, for example, is um, a result of developmental influences and how much is innate, how they interact with each other. It's, it's complicated. So there's no narcissism school for cats? <laughs> like a dog training school? Dog tra tra training school for cats? Hmm, I don't know. Maybe somebody should think of organizing one. <laughs> Getting away from uh, animals that live on Earth uh, to animals that live below Earth. Skip to German, uh, uh, mm -hmm. which would be a little easier for me to ask the questions. Uh, sind es Biologie unterirdisch lebender Nagetiere? Das ist wahrscheinlich ungefähr so naheliegend als Berufswunsch wie uh, Herausgeber eines Wissenschaftsmagazins, wenn man jung ist. Wie, wie kommt man dorthin? Oh je, also ich habe meinen Abschluss halt an der Universität Essen gemacht und da wurde ein neuer Professor berufen, äh, Hinek Burda und er kam mit, ich weiß nicht, 100 Nagetieren, die unter der Erde leben. Ich hörte bei ihm eine Vorlesung und war völlig begeistert. Ne, er hatte so einen tschechischen Singsang und er war ganz locker, hatte sehr viel Humor und ich wollte bei ihm eigentlich nur eine mündliche Prüfung machen und fragte ihn nach einer der Vorlesungen, kann ich eine mündliche Prüfung bei Ihnen machen. Ja, Sie können bei mir auch sogar die Abschlussarbeit schreiben. Und dann habe ich gesagt, oh, wow, wow. Ne? Ich habe als zweites Fach Mathematik. Ich studiere eigentlich auf Lehramt und wollte die Arbeit in der Mathematik schreiben. Und dann hatte er gesagt, ja, aber Mathematik ist ganz langweilig. Ich habe was viel Spannenderes. Ich zeige Ihnen mal die Tiere. Hier, das sind unterirdisch lebende Nagetiere. Es sind Graumulle. Sie sind verwandt mit Nacktmullen. Wollen Sie nicht darüber die Arbeit schreiben? Ja, und dann habe ich die Arbeit bei ihm geschrieben. Und danach hat er mir eine Doktorarbeit angeboten. Das hat gut geklappt. Und danach die Habilitation und so bin ich halt bei den Tieren geblieben. Und die Sinnesbiologie ist eigentlich auch nur ein Aspekt, den wir näher untersuchen. Also eigentlich, die Tiere sind total vielfältig. Also egal, was man näher betrachtet, das ist wie eine Goldgrube. Man findet immer spannende Sachen, die vorher unerforscht waren. Also eine Sache ist zum Beispiel, dass die Tiere keinen Krebs bekommen. Mhm. Da haben wir jetzt eine aktuelle Studie. Also selbst wenn wir versuchen, Krebs zu induzieren, also Hautkrebs, mhm dann bekommen sie keinen Krebs. Ne? Und da gehen wir natürlich der Frage nach, wie wehren sie das ab? So, so freundlich ist die Forschung an der Uni Duisburg-Essen. Ja, man muss natürlich die, einen Antrag stellen. Ne, dass und man, dann sagt man, da, darf ich Graumullen Krebs machen? Also da, so einfach geht das natürlich nicht. Ne? Man braucht für jeden Tierversuch einen Tierversuchsantrag. Das ist sehr aufwendig zu schreiben. Das geht dann x-mal auch zwischen den Behörden und den Forscherinnen bzw. Forschern hin und her. Man passt das dann an und ja, dann bekommt man den Antrag durch und darf mit der Forschung starten. Sage ich ganz kurz noch den Namen, Sabine Begal, genau. momentan äh, hinter dem Mikrofon. Jetzt äh, Graumulle, bevor wir uns kennengelernt haben, habe ich das noch nie gehört, dass es die Tiere überhaupt gibt. Die leben unterirdisch, ist klar, aber sieht man die irgendwo in freier Wildbahn oder wo leben die denn normalerweise, wenn sie nicht an der Uni Duisburg-Essen leben? Also in Europa wird man die nicht finden, denn die Tiere sind endemisch in Afrika, kommen dort südlich der Sahara vor. Es gibt verschiedene Arten und wir halten auch tatsächlich unterschiedliche Arten. Also das sind kleine Tiere zum Teil, die nur so 50, 60 Gramm auf die Waage ähm, bringen. Aber es gibt auch Riesengraumulle, da kann so ein ausgewachsenes Männchen auch schon mal 600 Gramm wiegen. Mhm. Also Schon ordentlich. Das ist für, für Graumulle wahrscheinlich Schon gewaltig, viel, genau. aber 600 Richtig. Gramm ist ja, nicht, ist einmal, nicht einmal ein Kilo, also genau. das ist kein Riesentier. Genau, also es sind nach wie vor 
ja, kleine Nagetiere, kleine Säugetiere. Wenn die in Afrika leben, wie kommen die dann nach Europa? Weil die werden sie ja nicht selber auf die Reise gemacht haben. Das ist richtig. Also wir haben die, also Professor Burda hat die in Ende der 80er Jahre, da hatte er einen Forschungsaufenthalt in Sambia und hat da erstmals Tiere nach Europa exportiert. Damals war es noch ganz spektakulär, da brauchte man keine Genehmigung, oh, hoffentlich verrate ich jetzt hier nicht irgendetwas, aber ich hoffe, das ist wenn, dann verjährt. Ähm, er hatte einen befreundeten Lufthansa-Kapitän mhm. und er hatte die Tiere gefangen und ihm die mit, dem, mit einem Eimer gegeben und der hat die tatsächlich im Eimer ins Cockpit genommen und die so nach Europa gebracht. Also das wäre heutzutage absolut unmöglich. Ja, heute würde man keinen Eimer mehr nehmen, sondern schon einen Koffer. Ja, heute würde man das alles mit offiziellen Genehmigungen machen, Importgenehmigung, Exportgenehmigung. Dür ähm, dürfte man das überhaupt noch? Endemisch lebende ja, Tiere in einem, nicht, auf einen anderen die Kontinent sind nicht bringen? Geschützt. Die sind nicht, die stehen jetzt nicht unter Artenschutz. Pech, ne? Pech gehabt. Ja, sagen wir mal so, in ähm, Sambia oder überhaupt in Afrika werden diese Tiere gejagt von professionellen Mulljägern und auch gegessen. Also man findet dort Mulljäger am Straßenrand, die diese Tiere an einem Stöckchen halten, lebend auch noch. Und äh, man kann dann sagen, ich hätte die gerne. Und die denken natürlich, äh, was sind das für komische Leute? Die wollen die kaufen, die wollen auch noch viele Tiere kaufen und die töten die dann noch nicht mal zum Essen. Nein, die wollen die dann auch noch ausfliegen aus Afrika. Jetzt wird das bei euch nicht gemacht, aber nur rein aus Interesse. Wie bereitet man denn ein Graumull zu? Wie isst man denn den? Soweit ich weiß, also ich bin Vegetarierin, einfach über Feuer gegrillt. Also, ne? ja. Häuten und dann ja, braten, genau, würzen genau. und braten? Ja, und äh, auch noch ein bisschen füllen. Also die Gedärme rausnehmen und füllen mit Gemüse beispielsweise. Also wenn du Vegetarierin bist, wirst du ja nicht wissen, wie die schmecken oder hast du einmal sicherheitshalber nee, gekostet? ich habe es nicht gekostet, aber ein Kollege von mir und der meint wie Hühnchen. Mhm. Oder Kaninchen, Mischung aus Hühnchen und Kaninchen. Aber halt sehr kleines. Ja, aber für die Einheimischen anscheinend eine wichtige Proteinquelle. Und für euch eine wichtige Forschungsquelle. Wie viele Tiere habt ihr da an der Uni? Mhm, ungefähr so 300 bis 350. Da kann's ähm, ordentlich. Ja, die reproduzieren sich gut und man kann die Zahl nicht so genau sagen. Es werden wieder Babys geboren, dann sterben mal Babys. Ne? Aber so um den mhm. Dreh sind es 300 bis 350 Tiere, die wir halten. Was sind denn die, die, die natürlichen Feinde, abgesehen von Mulljägern? Mhm. Äh, weil die, die, die natürlichen Feinde existieren ja wahrscheinlich bei euch auf der Universität nicht, sondern die Tiere leben ja, ist das ein paradiesisches Leben oder ist das ein besonders eintöniges Leben für die? Ich würde sagen, das ist schon ein sehr komfortables Leben, weil die Tiere nicht selbst auf Nahrungssuche gehen müssen. Im Freiland wären natürlich Schlangen, die in die Gänge eindringen könnten als potenzielle Beutegreifer. Und bei uns, wie gesagt, die werden gefüttert, die werden gepflegt, die werden täglich in Augenschein genommen. Also eigentlich haben die ein gutes Leben. Es kommt auch die Tierärztin regelmäßig vorbei, nimmt die Tiere in Augenschein und ähm, ja, Jetzt darf man bei Grundlagenforschung nie fragen, warum, aber was möchte man denn wissen, wenn man die Sinnesbiologie von unterirdisch lebenden Nagetieren beforscht? Uns geht es dabei um evolutionäre Anpassungen. Ne? Der, der, der unterirdische Lebensraum ist sehr speziell. Es ist dunkel. Es werden zum Beispiel nur tiefe Frequenzen besonders gut weitergeleitet. Höhere Frequenzen werden abgedämpft in den Gangsystemen. Und da kann man sich schon vorstellen, dass in der Sinnesbiologie bestimmte Anpassungen erfolgen. Ne? Und man kann Konvergenzen beispielsweise studieren. Also Tiere, die jetzt nicht miteinander verwandt sind, gehen die evolutionär in dieselbe Richtung. Oder gibt es da trotzdem Variabilität? Welche Sinne sind für die Tiere besonders von Interesse? Und man kann sich natürlich vorstellen, es ist dunkel, der Gesichtssinn, also das Sehen spielt eine untergeordnete Rolle. Die Augen sind ganz klein. Ne? Und trotzdem, und ist, das ist haben das wir. Das ist der auch Grund, warum Maulwürfe, aber vor allem Nacktmulle für unsere Verhältnisse ja so hässlich sind, weil das wurscht ist unter der Erde. Ich finde die gar nicht hässlich. Also weder Maulwürfe noch Nacktmulle noch Graumulle, ähm, würde ich sagen, sind hässliche Tiere. Aber es kann schon sein, dass man denkt, naja, also gerade der Nacktmull, ne? also manche sagen, der sieht aus wie ein Penis mit Zähnen vorne dran. Ähm, ja. 
Geld gilt bei manchen als das hässlichste Tier der Welt. Äh, das würde ich jetzt aber nicht sagen. Mhm. Und äh, du hast vollkommen recht, die Augen sind klein und möglicherweise für uns Menschen, für der, die der Gesichtssinn sehr wichtig ist, ne, könnte das eine wichtige Rolle spielen, mhm. dass wir jetzt keine großen Knopfaugen haben. Da springt das Kindchenschema nicht an. Ja, Sch Schweinsauger, das ist ein österreichischen Beschimpfung für jemanden, der besonders ausgefressen ist, wo die Augen in den Hintergrund treten. Also das ist eigentlich ah, nichts, ja. was bei uns charmanterweise eingesetzt wird, wenn man jemanden anspricht. Mhm. Und im, im Zuge dieser Forschungen seid ihr draufgekommen, dass äh, das Erdmagnetfeld äh, eine Rolle spielt. Mhm. In, in also der, der Anselgraumull war das erste Säugetier, bei dem ein Magnetsinn nachgewiesen wurde. Das war schon Ende der 80er, Anfang der 90er Jahre. Das hat Hinek Burda, damals war er noch in Frankfurt, war er Lecturer, ja, hat die Tiere da erforscht. Und weil dort... Ähm, Roswitha und Wolfgang Wilczko sitzen, ne, das sind so die Päpste der Magnetforschung, hatte er sich gedacht, Moment mal, unter das, der... Das ist, steht das auf der Visitenkarte? Na, Papst der Magnetforschung? Genau, Papst und Päpstin. <lacht> nee, das sind wirklich Koryphäen mhm. auf dem Gebiet. Und dann hat man sich überlegt, okay, wenn man unter der Erde nicht auf seine Augen zurückgreifen kann, ist es vielleicht sinnvoll, einen anderen Sinn einzusetzen? Ja, vielleicht der Magnetsinn. Das würde sehr helfen, sich unter der Erde zurechtzufinden. Also Magnetsinn ist jetzt nicht so, dass ein Graumull sehr gut am Kühlschrank haftet, sondern das ist genau. was anderes. Genau, das ist was anderes. Das machen diese Schaben, ne? die kann man an den Kühlschrank <lacht> werfen. Nee, äh, der, es geht einfach darum, die Feldlinien des Erdmagnetfelds wahrzunehmen, um sich dann daran zu orientieren in diesen, ja, hunderte, wenn nicht sogar Kilometer langen Gangsystem. Das wäre schon wichtig, wenn ich weiß, wo mein Nest ist, wo meine Futterkammer ist, um dann auch wieder zurückzufinden. Das ist wie ein Verkehrsleitsystem für die Tiere unter der Erde? So könnte man sich das vorstellen. Also für die räumliche Orientierung sicherlich sehr, sehr sinnvoll. Und wie, welche Sinnesorgane braucht man, um das Erdmagnetfeld so wahrnehmen zu können? Ja, das, das oder Witzige ist, dass bei keinem Tier, was als magnetorezeptiv gilt, also was in Verhaltensversuchen, wo nachgewiesen wurde, ja, die können offensichtlich das Magnetfeld wahrnehmen. Bei keinem dieser Tiere ist, sind bislang die Magnetrezeptoren gefunden worden. Also man hat ganz heiße Kandidaten, also dass zum einen die Augen eine Rolle spielen könnten, also mhm. zumindest bei Vögeln, das ist ziemlich sicher. Dann wurde mal diskutiert, dass es in der Oberschnabelhaut sitzt, bei Tauben beispielsweise. Das wurde aber dann 2012 auch widerlegt, dass das nur Makrophagen sind, also Zellen des Immunsystems. Also wer das herausfindet, der wird eine gute Science- oder Nature-Publikation haben. Mhm. Eventuell sogar mehr. Das heißt, auf, mehr. Auf, auf dem fast nicht ganz, aber fast molekularen Maßstab sucht man nach den Rezeptoren. Ganz genau, genau. Also aber das sind nicht irgendwelche Organe, die nein, man auf den genau, Blick weil, entdecken kann? Genau, weil das Ding ist ja, die Magnetfelder, die durchdringen einfach das Gewebe und die könnten, die Rezeptoren könnten irgendwo sein und die könnten auch ganz klein sein, praktisch wie kleine Kompassnadeln sich mit den Feldlinien beispielsweise ausrichten und dadurch Ionenkanäle öffnen, ähm, so dass dann das Signal generiert wird. Ja, aber das muss ja dann doch in der Nähe vom Gehirn irgendwo sein, weil das Gehirn muss nee, ja dann an, an die, an die ja. Extremitäten den, den Befehl weitergeben, in die Richtung oder in die andere Richtung. Das ist richtig, aber der könnte auch, das könnte im kleinen C sitzen. Mhm. Ne? Also wenn es über Nervenbahnen zum Gehirn geht, dann wäre es egal. Weil man unter der Erde eh nicht so eilig hat. Genau, aber wir haben, tatsächlich, <lacht> <lacht> wir haben tatsächlich Versuche auch gemacht bei den Graumulen, wo wir einmal die Augen betäubt haben mhm. und bei anderen, bei Kontrolltieren eben nicht. Wir haben ein Verhalten Versuch, wo wir den Tieren Zellstoff anbieten in so einer Arena und finden dann, dass die beim Nestbau ihre Nester vornehmlich im Südosten dieser kreisrunden Arena bauen. Und wenn man das, das Magnetfeld künstlich verändert, also man hat, arbeitet mit Helmholtz-Spulen oder mit sogenannten Merit-Spulen und kann dann zum Beispiel die horizontale Komponente des Magnetfeldes um 120 Grad oder 180 Grad drehen, wenn man dann Versuche macht, dann bauen die Tiere im neuen Südosten der Arena. Und das bringt dir dann welche Vorteile, dass es dann in der Früh schon in die Wohnung scheint? Na, das weiß ich nicht. <lacht> also warum, weil welchen Sinn es hat, den Südosten zu wählen, das ist... Wie bei uns Menschen wahrscheinlich, wenn man ja. mal was gewohnt ist seit vielen Generationen, Richtig, dann macht genau. man es einfach unhinterfragt ja. weiter. Genau. Ja. 
Jetzt ist fast erwartungsgemäß das passiert, was wir schon vermutet haben, bevor wir begonnen haben aufzunehmen, nämlich, dass es zu üppig ist, was es zu erzählen und befragen gibt, weshalb wir die erste Episode abschließen und in 14 Tagen eine zweite ausstrahlen werden, die wir aber natürlich viel früher aufnehmen schon, aber erst in 14 Tagen ausstrahlen, kommen jetzt wie immer am Ende des Podcasts zu Tipps und Verkündigungen. Als erstes erwähnen wir das sehr gern unser Buch, das erschienen ist am 26. September, bereits 15 Jahre seins, was das Wissenschaft ist, das was auch dann gilt, wenn man nicht dran glaubt, gibt es nach wie vor überall, wo es Bücher gibt und jetzt endlich auch als Hörbuch. Und zwar genau seit heute gibt es das Hörbuch unseres Jubelbuchs, gelesen von Thomas Leubel und uns im Hörverlag. Und natürlich gibt es auch die neue Show der Science Busters, nicht zu vergessen, Planet B mit Martin Puntigam, Florian Freistetter und Martin Muder am 8. und 9.12. im Stadtsaal in Wien. Der Oberhammer Award ist am 24.11. vergeben worden, aber der Livestream, der damals ausgestrahlt worden ist, den gibt es noch im Internet, auf YouTube oder auf unserer Website zu finden. Die Show, die wir gemeinsam gespielt haben mit Mark Abrahams, Mina Lyons, David Hugh, Sabine Begal und dir, Lisa Oberzaucher. Und zum Jahresende zwischen den Jahren, wie gern gesagt wird, Bauern Silvester mit Florian Freistetter, mit Ruth Grützbauch und mit Martin Puntigam. Am 27.12. in der helmut list in Graz und am 30.12. im Stadtsaal in Wien. Und am 31.12. ist auch heuer wieder Silvester, deshalb gibt es den traditionellen naturwissenschaftlichen Jahresrückblick der Science Busters schon seit vielen, vielen Jahren. Heuer heißt Silvester Edition 2022 oder 2022, wem das lieber ist. Diesmal wieder im Schauspielhaus Wien, 18.21 Uhr, Uhr, zwei Vorstellungen, um das Jahr rauszukehren mit Florian Freistetter, Martin Moder und mir und das letzte Mal Wissenschaft für heuer. Alle Links, Hinweise, Studien, äh, unter anderem auch den Link zum Livestream findet man wie immer in den Shownotes. Und Fragen zur heutigen Folge und auch alle anderen Fragen, die wir beantworten sollen äh, und dann hoffentlich auch können, bitte an podcast.sciencebusters.at oder über Instagram, Facebook oder andere Anschlüsse. Gerne auch als Audiofile, damit wir Fragen einspielen, wenn Sie den kommen und beantworten können. Danke an die TU Wien und die Uni Graz, die die Produktion des Podcasts unterstützen. Danke fürs Zuhören, Streamen, Downloaden, Abonnieren, Bewerten, Empfehlen über der Erde und unter der Erde. In der nächsten Ausgabe reden wir weiter mit David Yu und Mark Abrahams, Mina Lyon und Sabine Begal und Elisabeth Oberzaucher. Und es geht noch einmal um den Ig Nobelpreis und die Forschung rundherum. Bis dann, bis zum nächsten Mal. Schöne Zeit. Baba. Ja.